If you're a parent, teacher, or school leader, and you're sick and tired of the frustration, anger, and unfair treatment of children at high risk in our public schools, then perhaps it's time for all of us to do something about it. In this podcast, Dr. Amitra Berry brings you tips, tools, strategies, and tactics to build successful solutions while touching, moving, and inspiring all of us to transform our schools so that every child thrives. Here's your host, Dr. Berry. Money makes the world go around, right? And underfunding schools filled with marginalized learners, well, that creates an inequitable world and future for the children who attend those underfunded schools. Hello, Equity Warriors. Thanks for joining me today. Today, I want to talk about an issue that touches all of us, school funding, whether it touches you as a taxpayer or as a parent or grandparent caregiver of a child who attends one. But this isn't just about money. It's about fairness, opportunities, and shaping the lives of young people and the survival of this grand experiment in democracy and free enterprise that's called America. So let's dig in. What's all the fuss about? So imagine your neighborhood or your neighborhood school being like a car. To run, it needs fuel. Premium, unleaded, mid-grade, right? In the case of a school, though, that fuel is cash. Not all cars get premium fuel. Not all schools get premium dollars. Why? Well, different schools do need different things. But what's shocking is that the schools that need the most are usually the ones that are getting the least. And that's because where you live in America affects how much money goes to the schools in your neighborhood. In some states, schools have faced a decrease in funding year over year since 2008. Florida took the biggest hit in that amount of time with an 18% cut in funding. There are some states like Arizona and Nevada where the spending per learner is less than $11,000 a year. And I'm going to get into some specific numbers, but when you get to New York or Vermont, more than double. Another gap. Why? Well, we can look at funding through several different lenses. If we look at straight dollars per student and only the dollars that come from state and local funding, we have the top five states, New York, D.C., New Jersey, Vermont, and Connecticut. The top five spend between $22,000 and $24,000 per student per year, 22 to 24. Bottom five states, Oklahoma, Nevada, Arizona, Idaho, and Utah only eight to nine thousand dollars per student. Eight to nine compared to twenty two to twenty four. The three I always talk about, California, Florida, Texas, they're always the biggest. They're always going to get a little bit extra attention from me. So California comes in nineteenth at thirteen thousand six hundred forty two dollars per student. Florida fortieth at nine thousand nine eighty three and Texas forty second at nine thousand eight hundred seventy one dollars. But then you throw in federal money and consider the cost of living in each of those states and the water gets very muddy. Different states do funding for schools different ways. For example, California, New York and Texas do give more money to schools that need it the most. Others, not so much. Let's take Oregon, for example. They give more money to high poverty districts, more Title I students, but they give less money to districts that have more students of color. And then um, Nevada, let's just say they've dropped the ball completely. As a country, the U.S. isn't a whole lot better. The United States allocates about 11.6% of public funds to education. That's below the international standard, which is 15%. The U.S. spends about 4.96% of its gross domestic product, GDP, on education. That's compared to 5.59%, the average of all other developed nations. We are not number one. And we are not the greatest when it comes to education. Some harsh realities here. The biggest issue, in my humble opinion, is which children get what amount of funding. Now, some states do give more funds to high needs districts based on the number of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. We know we have known for decades that family income is directly correlated to academic 
outcomes. Those children who don't have opportunities for enrichment outside of school, those children whose parents can't pay for them to go to Kumon or to Sylvan or have private tutors, well, they need more in-school supports if they're going to have equal achievement with their high wealth peers. Some states provide additional funding to support emergent bilingual learners and to support children who are in foster care. But we have a lot of shocking truths as we start to dig into those numbers. School districts with more students of color, remember less money in many places? They get 16% less money per learner than districts which have fewer students of color. The browner the district, the less green it gets. And this unfair treatment also applies to schools with more emergent bilingual learners, students uh, from low-income families. Now, yeah, it's complicated. And there are factors, everything from local poverty, poverty tax revenue to how well a state's economy is doing. And there are lawsuits popping up all the time now about this unfairness because it's becoming the norm. Yes, there's a cost to equality, to leveling the playing field. It would cost quite a bit of money. Some estimates are, say that it would take about $95 billion, with a B, billion dollars a year to get everyone to the national average on test scores. If we want to aim high, let's say we want to get all our learners across all 50 states and territories as well, performing like the top performing states like Massachusetts, that number, that $95 billion, has to quadruple plus. It's an astronomical $400 billion a year to increase academic achievement across the board. But underfunding our schools has a big opportunity cost, and it isn't just about money. It's about what that money could have provided if it went to the right places. Better books, technology, internet access, after school programs, you name it. Over half of the kids in K-12 districts are not getting what they should. And students of color, again, bear the biggest brunt of this. These same schools and these students are still reeling from the effects of COVID. The pandemic threw a huge wrench into all of this. Schools are still estimated to need another $500 billion to recover from COVID. And that's on top of the $190 billion that's already been provided. What this shows us is that things have not gotten better since COVID. It's actually gotten worse, more serious, particularly affecting our marginalized communities. And sure, there's emergency funds from the government, and sure, that should have fixed it. But a lot of times, the money doesn't get to the schools, to the children that need it the most. It's like we have this big charity food drive, but the people who are underfed and unhoused, don't have transportation to get to the place where we're giving away the food. And this happens because of flawed policies, even Title I, that supposedly helps, but sometimes actually ends up widening the gap even more. And in states where voucher initiatives are being pushed, this conversation becomes even more convoluted, so much so that I'm not even gonna touch vouchers. I'll save that for another episode. Folks, we need real change here. There are groups that are advocating for better funding policies, and some suggest that all states should take control of how property taxes are used for school funding. There are multiple models in existence, and each one has some controversy to it. These aren't easy fixes, no. But what's clear is that we need to work at the federal, state, and local levels to really make a difference. This isn't just about a spreadsheet and dollar signs. It's about giving every single young person in our country a fair chance. And when we underfund schools, we underinvest in our children's futures. In the end, having a well-educated community benefits all of us in ways just beyond the money. Find out what's going on in with school funding in your community. Where does the money come from? Where does it go? Where is the accountability? Get involved, register to vote, and vote in your local and state elections. Follow me on your favorite social media platform and continue to join me every week. Send me your questions, topics, and requests to info at askdrberry.com, and I'll answer your questions and bring you some experts to help address the topics. As always, don't worry about the things you cannot change. Change the things you can no longer accept. And I'll see you next time. 
That's it for today's episode of the 3E Podcast. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. One lucky listener every single week that posts a review on iTunes will win a chance in a grand prize drawing to win a $25,000 value private VIP day with Dr. Barry herself. Be sure to head over to 3epodcast.com and pick up a free copy of Dr. Barry's gift. Then join us on the next episode.